This next part of the lecture will be dealing with samples, populations and statistical inference. Inference is when we are trying to work out what we can say about the population from our sample. And so it's important up front to define what we mean by these things. The population is all individuals in whom we are interested. So basically everyone to whom we might want to generalize our results. When I say individuals here, this might mean individual people, and a lot of the time it will. For a lot of you, this will refer, for example, to individual patients. However, that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Sometimes you might be interested in a different entity, for example, an organization, a particular hospital, or a particular surgery, or it might be a location, or even a, a separate observation of a phenomenon. It's whatever you're measuring at the lowest level. But in most cases, you will find this will be about individuals, whether those individuals are patients, members of the public, employees, or whatever it is that you're looking at. The sample is all the cases that you collect data from. Now this usually refers to all of the people in your data set. Occasionally you may have uh, other people uh, who were originally in your sample but had to drop out from a particular anal analysis. We'll ignore that for the time being, uh, but we'll come back to the issue of missing, missing data later in the module. Really though, in order to draw good inference about the population, what we need is our sample to be representative of that population. And where possible, a random sample is the best way of doing this. That's not necessarily to say that your sample needs to be representative of the wider population, but just of the population about whom you are interested in drawing inference. So, for example, if you're interested in seeing to what extent a drug treats a particular um, condition successfully, really, you're only going to be testing people with that condition, and you only want to be able to generalize to people with that condition. So in that case, your population might be all individuals with this particular condition. What you see on this slide is a set of possible things we might be trying to estimate in the population, the mean, standard deviation, proportion, rate, uh, and others are possible as well, things like correlations, odds ratios, relative risks, all the things that we might be trying to understand in the population. And in the table we see that there are four of these uh, I've given which have a population parameter, that's the thing we're trying to estimate, which is denoted by a Greek letter. Uh, mu for mean, sigma for standard deviation, pi for proportion and lambda for rate although those Greek letters don't particularly matter too much, but you will see them used sometimes for that purpose. Of course, we don't know what that population parameter is. If we knew that, we wouldn't have to go ahead and do the analysis. Instead, what we do is we find out what the equivalent statistic is in our sample. So for mean, that's often denoted by an X bar, that's next with a line above it. Uh, for standard deviation, S, proportion, P, and rate, are. And what we try to do is dictate what we can say about the population parameter from the sample statistic. How can we infer what the population is like from what we know about our sample? And what we really want to do is make some inference about the population from the sample. And that goes beyond simply saying what the estimate of a particular parameter might be. It looks at the extent to which we can be certain about the value of that parameter. So, for example, we might be interested in asking what is the average weight of newborn babies in the population? 
or is there a real association between red meat consumption and mortality? We can look at the statistics from our sample directly, but what we really want to know is, is this a good estimate of what the actual effect or the actual uh, average is in the population? And so to do this, we follow a general procedure which involves calculating the sample statistics, which, as I mentioned before, form the best estimates of the population parameters most of the time. We then calculate the degree of certainty about these estimates, and we usually do this by calculating a standard error. The standard error is just the standard deviation of the sample statistic. It's a measure of how certain we can be about the value of that statistic. And from the standard error, we can conduct hypothesis tests or construct confidence intervals or do both. Now, I'll come on to each of these things in turn. Um, but just before I do, uh, you'll notice at the bottom it says this requires assumptions to be made. One assumption that always has to be made is that our sample is representative of the population in respect of what we are looking at at this moment. So if we're looking at uh, estimating the average weight of babies, newborn babies in a population, we have to know or assume at least that our sample is indeed representative and that we're not simply going and taking our sample from a part of the population where the babies are lighter or heavier than in general. Other particular techniques require more detailed assumptions to be made as well. I'm not going to go into those more today, but over the coming weeks we will see these as we look at different procedures. To give an example of this, let's start off with a fairly basic situation where we might be looking to estimate just a straightforward proportion. And a sample of 700 NHS employees, this is a real data set which we will be looking at in coming weeks. It, the sample showed that 232 of them, which is 33.1%, had some sickness absence in the previous six months. What we actually did is we sent a questionnaire to all of these uh, employees and asked them to indicate whether they'd been off sick over the previous six months. And just under a third of them, 33.1%, said they had. So what we want to know is how accurately we can estimate the proportion in the population. We know that our best estimate will be 33.1%, but of course, it's very unlikely that exactly 33.1% in the whole of the NHS would be uh, absent over this period. The chances are it will be a little bit below that or a little bit above that. The question really is, what do we mean by a little bit? In particular, a target may have been set which would require the level to be below 40%. Can we say that this has been achieved? So to do this, what we'd need to do is calculate the likelihood that actually the population proportion is below 40%. We know that it's going to be at least reasonably likely that it will be below 40% because our best estimate is somewhat below 40%. But what we really want to know is whether it's very likely. And so we do this by calculating a number of different steps. First of all, we calculate P, which, as I mentioned a few slides ago, is what we call the sample proportion. In this case, the sample proportion is 
n, which is what we usually use to denote the sample size, here is 700. Now the best estimate of the population proportion, which um, I called pi on the previous slide, this is indeed just the sample proportion, or 0 0.331. But to get an idea of how reliable this is, we calculate the standard error of the proportion. And the st standard error of a sample proportion is given by the formula you see here, the square root of p times 1 minus p divided by n. That's something that we will come into in subsequent weeks, and I wouldn't expect you to know that or remember that for now, but um, it's something that we will look at in more detail subsequently. If we put the values of p and n into this formula here, we get the standard error being 0 0.018. And as I mentioned earlier, that standard error is actually the standard deviation of the sample mean. And a good way of thinking about that is if we were to take this sample of 700 people many, many times, so it would be a slightly different 700 people each time, we would probably end up with a mean value of 0 0.331 and the standard deviation of those values would be 0 0.018. That in itself tells us a certain amount, but what it doesn't tell us is how likely it is that this is below the 40% level that we are targeting. So there are two ways we could go about this. The first is using hypothesis tests. And this section on hypothesis tests is one of the really important things to understand from this introductory lecture, because a lot of what we will do in subsequent weeks, particularly from week four onwards, is based around hypothesis tests. Now, generally, we would start off with an original hypothesis. This is a statement that we would want to verify or we believe might be true. For example, here, we might have the hypothesis that the absent rate, the proportion of staff being absent over the six-month period, is below 40%. Actually, what we have to do here is test what's called the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is a statement that we are actually trying to disprove. The reason is it's quite difficult in fact, almost impossible in statistics to prove a statement, it's much easier to disprove one. So what we take is a hypothesis of no effect. Now that might mean that there's no correlation between two variables, or there's no difference between two groups. Here, it could be that there is no difference between the staff absence rate and 40%. In other words, the staff absence rate is 40%. So this is the null hypothesis. And what we then do is call our original hypothesis the alternative hypothesis. And this is usually denoted by HA as opposed to H0, which is the null hypothesis. So to think about the two examples we've been talking about here, if we go back to the red meat consumption, our alternative hypothesis would be that there is a positive association between the amount of red meat consumed and mortality. The null hypothesis is that there is no association between the amount of red meat consumed and mortality. So we may believe that there is a, an association, some correlation of some sort, but we actually try to disprove that there is no association. In terms of the staff absence example, the null hypothesis, as I said, would be that exactly 40% of staff have been off sick. The alternative hypothesis would be that fewer than 40% of staff 
have been off sick. Now, when we test the hypothesis, we perform a statistical procedure, which will vary depending on exactly what type of data we have and what the design is. We'll come onto that um, quite a lot over the coming weeks. But in each case, the test will give us what's called the p-value. Now, the p-value, and this is critical, is the probability of observing data as extreme as our sample if H0, the null hypothesis, is true. So that's saying if there is actually no effect in the population, how likely is it that we would observe the data that we observe, or data even more extreme? So if, for example, exactly 40% of NHS staff had been off sick over the previous six months, how likely is it that in a sample of 700, 33.1% of the sample, or even less than that, would have been off sick? If the p-value is smaller than a chosen significance level, which we denote as alpha, then we reject the null hypothesis. Now, usually, by convention, we would use 0 0.05 for alpha, which would mean that there would be a less than 5% chance of rejecting the null hypothesis if it's true. So, actually, if the null hypothesis is true, and there is no effect or no difference in 40%, then this means that we would get it wrong and reject it wrongly at most 1 in 20 times. And this means we would normally accept our original hypothesis. That is, as long as the effect is in the right direction. And I'll say a bit more about that in just a moment. However, if the p-value is greater than alpha, then we can't conclude anything definitively at all. We can't reject the null hypothesis, but this doesn't mean that the null hypothesis is definitely true. In fact, really what it means is we can't say for sure whether the null hypothesis is true or not. So for the staff absence example, as a reminder, the alternative hypothesis is that fewer than 40% of staff have been off sick. The null hypothesis would be that exactly 40% of staff have been off sick. To test this, we test this particular statistic, which is the difference between the null value and the observed value divided by the standard error of that difference. Again, that's something that um, I wouldn't expect you to know or remember at this point, but we will come back to this at a later stage. If the null hypothesis is true, then this particular test statistic has what we call a Z distribution. That is a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And in this case, the value given is 3.73. And so what we have to do is compare this with the Z distribution, see how likely it is we find a value of 3.73 or higher, or indeed minus 3.73 or lower with the Z distribution. And actually the probability that that happens is less than 0 0.001. In other words, less than one time in a thousand would we find this by chance. And so we would conclude that the null hypothesis almost certainly isn't true here. We reject the null hypothesis and instead we would say that our alternative hypothesis, that the absence rate is below 40%, 
is supported. Now, one thing that I've been slightly skirting over so far is the issue of whether it is a positive effect or a negative effect, or whether the absence rate is higher than 40% or lower than 40%. And this comes down to what we refer to as one-sided or two-sided tests. In the diagram of the normal distribution, which is in the top right-hand corner of this screen, you will see a representation of what a p-value is. The critical values, which are represented by 5%, um, actually refer to 2.5% at the bottom of the bell curve and 2.5% at the top of the bell curve, normally speaking. The p-value that you see here is the probability that a value is higher than a value we observe or a particular, uh, oh sorry, or lower than a negative value, an equivalent negative value. So in the last example, 3.73 was the value we saw, which would be some way out towards the far right hand side of this particular normal distribution. Minus 3.73 is down at the other end. Now, most of the time, we would say that we need to take both sides into account. Because, generally speaking, if we find a large value or a small value, it would be interesting to us. It would be entirely relevant to know not only whether eating red meat increases chance of mortality, but it would equally be interesting to know whether red meat decreases the chance of mortality. And in these situations, we need to do what's called the two-sided test, which takes both sides of the distribution into account. Whether one-sided tests, which only take one side of, side of the distribution into account, are appropriate or not, is a matter of some debate. However, my take on this is that if there is a situation where it would be entirely unremarkable for something to be in the wrong direction, in other words, the unhypothesized direction, then maybe in those situations we could do a one-tailed test which effectively means the p-value would be halved because one of those two red zones on the diagram would be eliminated. Most of the time, though, that's not the case. I suppose one example where it might be the case is this staff absence rate. What we are, sorry, what we are interested in is whether or not the value is below 40%. If the value is exactly 40%, or if it's above 40%, then we've missed our target. So in those cases, you might argue that a one-sided test would be more appropriate. In our case, it wouldn't make a scrap of difference because it's going to be significant in either case. But we will see throughout the module references to one-sided or two-sided tests, or sometimes called two tailed tests, because they're looking at two different tails of this distribution. However, that is um, something that I think will become more clear as you see actual examples. So if you've struggled to understand these last four or five minutes about the one-sided or two-sided tests, then don't be too hard on yourself, um, but it's worth referring back to this after we've seen some actual examples later in the module. The final thing to say about this section of the lecture 
um, is that hypothesis testing, of course, can go wrong. When I say go wrong, I mean it can lead to the wrong result. Really, there are two possibilities. Either the null hypothesis is true, or the null hypothesis is false. If the null hypothesis is false, this means we normally have some kind of effect. If the null hypothesis is true, this normally represents no effect or no difference between groups, for example. Now, obviously, if the null hypothesis is true and the test result is not significant, then that's a correct finding. However, if the null hypothesis is true and we find a significant result, what we call a false positive result, this is referred to as a type 1 error. And the type 1 error occurs to a particular level, at a particular rate, and we set that rate. That's what the alpha, or the, the critical p-value, refers to. We can make sure that this is going to happen one time in 20. We can make it less than that if we want. But we can set that. However, if the null hypothesis is false, then really we want to find a significant result. That would be the correct finding. But if we don't find a significant result, this is what we call a false negative or a type 2 error. And really, what we want to do is minimise the probability of getting a type 2 error. The probability of a type 2 error is known as beta, um, and 1 minus beta is called the power, the power of a particular test. And the power is the probability of detecting an effect if it does actually exist. And the best way of improving power is by having a larger sample. And very often you'll hear about power calculations. You've probably come across these already, where what you actually need to do is determine what your sample size should be in order to find a particular effect with a particular level of power. But the important thing for now is that you recognise that there are going to be these type 1 errors occasionally where you find a significant result even though the null hypothesis is true. And probably more frequently than that you'll get type 2 errors which is where there is an effect but we just don't have enough data to be able to detect it. That concludes this section of the lecture. In the final section I will discuss estimation.